This video is sponsored by Audible. Use my link, audible.com slash the dom, or text the dom to 500, 500 to get a free book, two free Audible originals, and a 30 day free trial. Hello, my beautiful watchers, and welcome to the last time that I will ever have to put myself through the sheer hell of reading anything by E.L. James. Before we go any further, a quick warning to any new watchers. If you've come here seeking a real dominance opinion on Fifty Shades, I'm afraid there's been a bit of a misunderstanding. In this particular instance, Dom is short for Dominic, and the THE part is just an arrogant online handle. However, you might want to stick around anyway. I'm told my hatred of this series is quite cathartic to listen to. For returning beautiful watchers as well, in case you've forgotten the modus operandi here, because I don't want to have to explain the context of all of my complaints in the upcoming review episode as I go through it, and I especially don't want you to have to read this book, I'm providing a plot synopsis video in advance. I'm going to try, probably fail, but try to just describe the plot of this book in this particular video. The outraged horror and hopefully compelling explanations as to why this isn't okay is coming, I promise. Just be patient. First of all though, the usual trigger warning. Apologies that we have to go through this every time, but the world doesn't seem to have caught on yet, so if I could remind my audience that the actual legitimate use of the word triggered has nothing to do with people getting unreasonably offended, upset, or angry about something, and my personal belief is that people who use it in that context need to be slapped upside their heads and told to grow the fuck up because they are cheapening its meaning for people who desperately need to use it. Being triggered is a term recognized by the medical community to mean a variety of things, most relevantly a stimulus that causes someone who has suffered past trauma to have an extreme involuntary emotional or physical reaction to it. Now that we've established this, please be aware that the book that I'm about to synopsize unintentionally involves, I would even say glorifies, an extremely abusive relationship, elements of which might act as a trigger if you are one of the upsettingly huge amount of people who have experienced this sort of thing firsthand. I would also like to warn everyone that I will be monitoring the comments section of this and all other other upcoming videos on this subject. If I see anyone mocking, belittling, or devaluing the experiences of abuse survivors, they will be permanently put on a list that deletes any and all future comments they try to make on my channel, and I will not feel bad about doing this in any way. If there was a way to stop them from even seeing my work in the future, I would do that too. And finally, for the pre-warnings, there are a lot more sex scenes in this book, even compared to the last two. Somehow, they are even less erotic and more pointless and disconnected from the story than before too, so I hope you'll forgive me for not mentioning every last one. If you would be so kind as to pretend that between every sentence here, I'm stopping to say, and then they have sex, and Anna really enjoys it because she orgasms at the slightest touch from her husband or a light gust of wind. Right then, sorry this intro was so long, are you sitting comfortably? Probably not for long, let's begin. The first chapter of this book begins with a short flashback to Grey as a child hanging out with his recently deceased mother, followed by a jumbled non-sequential telling of Anna and Grey's wedding, flight to Europe, and honeymoon. Starting near the end of the honeymoon, then dream sequencing back to their wedding for at least half the chapter. We discover that the build-up to the wedding was extremely stressful for Anna because Grey threw a huge hissy fit when she refused to swear to obey him in her wedding vows and sulked about it for days. Yes, the first few pages of this book are a very effective reminder of what a pathetic, selfish, immature man-baby the love interest is. Apparently Grey set the date at about one month after his proposal and chose his parents' mansion as the location. One month may seem like an insanely short amount of time to you, and you would be right, but remember, it almost doubles the total amount of time these two people have known each other. The book returns us to the present just in time for Grey to lose his shit at Anna because she took off her top on a topless beach. I should qualify that it was her intention to lie face down, but she turned over while napping. This apparently matters not to Grey as he slut shames her right there on the beach and rants about how other people are seeing what's his. If your reaction to this was righteous outrage at his unacceptable behaviour, you are more than justified, but might I recommend you pace yourself slightly because this is just the tip of the iceberg for this book. They go back to argue on the big ass boat that Grey has rented to serve as their hotel, and in classic Anna Chrissy Boy fashion, they don't really resolve anything, she just concedes on any and all of her arguments to calm him down, and then they have sex. This chapter is also confusingly non-sequential because we're treated to another exceptionally long flashback to Grey telling his adoptive father he's refusing to arrange a prenuptial agreement with Anna. I allowed myself a few blissful moments of imagining Anna taking him for everything he has and leaving him alone and broken like he deserves to be for his multiple acts of abuse, but 
Alas, E.L. James would never be so kind. Grey also instructs Anna not to urinate before they have sex. He later claims this was to greatly increase her pleasure when she orgasms. The next morning, Anna wakes up to discover in the mirror that Grey has made sure that she can't show off any more cleavage during their honeymoon by giving her huge red hickeys all over her breasts and chest. She is furious at him for this, for about five minutes until he admits he might have been wrong to do it and she instantly forgives him because, you know, he had a hard childhood. He's also convinced her that her crime of rolling over in her sleep is equal if not greater to his temporary non-consensual disfigurement of her, so they agree to call it quits. He has super important business guy work stuff to do that day, so she goes shopping in the nearby town. He has another minor freak out because she dares to use the jet ski to get to shore without asking his permission first. There's yet another weirdly long and detailed flashback to earlier in the honeymoon where Grey insisted on shaving her genitalia for her with his razor despite her reluctance over the matter. Now to be fair, she gets to shave his face for him later and he has trust issues and stuff, so I guess that's the same thing. It's not. It's, it's not the same thing at all. Just because you're married doesn't mean she doesn't get to have boundaries, Grey. While shopping, Anna remembers that Grey used to take nude photos of his submissives and keep them as potential blackmail in case they ever thought about breaking their non-disclosure agreements. This memory inclines her to buy him a Nikon camera so he can take sexy photos of her as well. I'm really not sure how she connected those dots, but I'm sure none of us are surprised by this woman's incredibly warped logic at this point, considering her past behaviour. Grey is freaked out by the idea at first because he is aware that he was using those photos for evil, but goes along with it anyway. Grey tells Anna that someone broke into his company's headquarters and unsuccessfully tried to burn down the computer mainframe, but won't give her any more details than that because he fully admits he thinks of her as a precious child he needs to protect. And fuck. Because of this attempted arson, Grey steps up security tenfold. Anna is now followed around everywhere by a team of bodyguards like she's the first fucking lady. When they finally get back from their honeymoon, Grey lets Anna drive his sports car and they end up in a really boring high-speed chase with a car that his security team believes might be following them. They shake their tail by hiding in a parking lot and pass the time waiting to hear about what happens between their assailant and their guards by dogging. Google it but not at work. They then go home and there's almost an entire chapter dedicated to describing him using a butt plug on her, which sounds insane, but the chapter is only like a dozen pages because even on her third book, James still doesn't quite understand how books are supposed to work. Then they find out their incompetent security team lost the car that was following them and Anna recognizes Jack Hyde, the man who tried to rape her in the previous book from the security footage from the attempted arson. Incidentally, of fucking course this book contains the tidiest of all these CSI tropes. Enhance the image, tech guy, because that's how cameras have ever worked. There's a secret supply of reserve pixels that usually aren't in use but can be unlocked when someone really wants to see something. Grey resists involving the police at this point because the next day, Anna goes back to work at the publishing firm she worked for for all of a few days, but somehow still believes that she wasn't made the head editor of just because Grey bought the company. At this glorious point in the story, Grey finds out she intends to keep using her maiden name at work for professional reasons, and... Yeah, this is a somewhat notorious part of the book. I'd heard of it long before I ever picked it up. He drops everything at his job running a multi-company empire and drives over to her office using his clout as the company owner to evict her staff and get her alone. He then berates her, berates her for not wanting to use his name at work, explaining that without it, no one will know that she's his property. During this conversation, he refers to her both as one of his assets and an errant wife that needs to be put in her place shortly before trying to coerce her into having sex with him in her office. You are mine, Miss Steele. You belong to me, and I will be damned if I'll let any man who doesn't know that within 100 feet of your disobedient little hide. You're lucky I even let you leave the apartment, let alone work this silly job of yours. My palm is twitching so hard right now. So anyway, uh, quickie. Anna wishes to explain to him that she can't use his name at work because since he bought the company, everyone instantly knowing that she's the boss's wife has made her working relationship with her immediate superiors impossibly awkward and sometimes openly hostile, but doesn't feel that she can for fear of his violent reaction to the information. She almost, 
almost grows a spine here, but just in time realizes that Gray's feelings were hurt by her not using his name. His feelings! So she returns to being an invertebrate for the rest of the argument. Gray then drops the bombshell that she has to use his name because he plans to make her the new owner and CEO of the company and rename it Gray Publishing. Anna is taken aback enough by this that she agrees to all of his demands just to get him to leave, but festers on the subject all day until they meet back home and go over all the same points again. She tries to make him understand that she doesn't want her lifelong dream of working in publishing to be bought out of hand and given to her as a late wedding gift, and that there's a big difference between being an editor and being a CEO, but shockingly, her resolve crumbles like a card tower in an earthquake, and Grey gets his way about everything. The arrival of Gia, the architect in charge of designing the renovations to Grey's recently purchased mansion, really pisses Anna off because, in her opinion, she's too flirty with Grey. To combat this issue, Anna dresses up super sexy and puts on makeup because then she'll look as pretty as her rival, I guess? As soon as they're alone together, she accuses her of trying to seduce her husband and tells her that he's not interested and to back off or she'll get her fired. Anna then congratulates herself for a few minutes on becoming such a strong-willed and powerful woman because nothing says strength like bullying someone in your employ who can't say anything back to you without losing their whole career. We're then treated to a painfully long description of Anna giving Grey a haircut in the bathroom where they get distracted and have sex halfway through. I swear I have never been so bored in my life than I was reading this book. While looking for some scissors, Anna sees Grey's bodyguard Taylor making out with his housekeeper, Mrs. Jones. While she is super shocked by this, I personally cannot think of a single piece of information less interesting and unnecessary to include in a book, and, of course, in classic E.L. James style, it contributes absolutely nothing to the plot. She also discovers that Grey is keeping a revolver in his desk drawer. When she finally works up the courage to ask him about it, he tells her that it belonged to the crazy ex-subgirl from the last book. You know, the one she tried to use to kill her. When Anna suggests that he take some shooting lessons to learn how to use it, Grey refuses on the grounds that he's actively very pro-gun control. Seeing as Grey's security team thought that the person following them in the world's least interesting car chase might have been a woman, Anna asks Grey if the crazy ex-subgirl might be involved. And no, I still don't think it's worth learning her name. Grey reveals that, despite being super protective of Anna when it comes to things like jet skis and alone time, he took no legal action against the woman who tried to shoot her dead, and is in fact paying for her to go to art school. Before he flies away on a business trip, Anna has to beg Grey to allow her to see her best friend Kate, who he has successfully isolated her from since their marriage began. He eventually agrees, but makes her promise that they won't actually go anywhere, just drink together in his penthouse. As soon as Kate turns up, it takes her all of a few seconds to convince Anna to go back on her promise, because Kate is slightly closer to being a fully functioning human being who knows when to tell someone unreasonable to fuck off. They go out for a few drinks and talk about how lucky they are to be with their respective super awesome perfect dream men. Unironically. Anna gets a text message from Grey telling her that he is apoplectic with rage because she disobeyed him, which takes a lot of the fun out of the evening, but somehow doesn't change her mind about him being her soulmate. When she returns home, she finds that Jack Hyde had broken into Grey's apartment with the intention of kidnapping her, but got the piss beaten out of him by one of Grey's many hired goons. It's surprisingly difficult for Anna to talk Grey's private army into calling the police about this because Grey has never let them do that before. The next morning, Anna wakes up to find that Grey is sitting by by her bed watching her sleep. While he is somewhat concerned that a man broke into his apartment with the intention of kidnapping his wife, he's much, much more immediately interested in threatening to beat her for disobeying him. Take a wild guess how this conversation turns out. If you said anything other than Anna admits full fault, then Grey fucks her, I'm deeply worried for your reasoning ability. Not, however, before Anna attempts to justify the thing she shouldn't have had to justify in the first place by playing up a sexist stereotype, claiming that it can't be her fault that she changed her mind on the issue because she's a woman. Women just change their mind a lot. The next day, Anna suddenly realizes there's a mathematical plot hole in the timeline. For Chrissy Boy to have gotten home in time to be there when she woke up, he must have left when he found out she had gone out for a drink, not when he found out a crazy man had broken into his home. She's mad enough about this to message him at work. He is predictably defensive and dismissive of just how fucking insane it is that he cancelled an important overseas business trip to fly home and berate his wife for going out with a friend. Later, when she gets home, he blatantly tries to use his sexual wiles on her to derail the conversation and almost succeeds, but she persists in being angry at him for a few more minutes. Until she once again decides that none of Grey's actions are his fault because, you know, 
He had a hard childhood. They agree to sex away their issues for the 10 millionth time, but Grey decides she still needs to be punished for her non-crimes and uses orgasm denial to make her feel so shit she uses the safe word for the first time in their relationship. James proves for the 20 millionth time that she hasn't the faintest clue what a real healthy BDSM relationship involves by writing in Grey passive-aggressively guilt-tripping her for this. Oh yes, how dare she not consider how it might make him feel bad about what an asshole he was being to her. Grey reveals that the police have told him that he and Hyde might have some sort of connection, as they were both born, orphaned, and adopted in Detroit. Spoiler warning, this mysterious backstory they share is brought up a lot for the rest of the book and ends up contributing bugger all to the story. Okay, this is all getting a bit much for me, so would you mind terribly if we took a quick break to talk about something a little happier? My legit favourite application, for example. I am unashamed of my love for Audible. It's an effective way of bringing more books into more people's lives, so it can't be surprising to anyone that I'm a big fan. Audible is an absolute must for anyone with busy lifestyles, long boring car journeys to get through with their sanity intact, or just need something to occupy their minds while they take a much needed chill out session. It's also a way for my dyslexic brethren to enjoy these same book experiences as everyone else, so it has a personal significance to me. Now, for the sake of honesty, I will say that this book is available, but do you know what else is available? Some of the best damn books ever written. They've got the Lord of the Rings trilogy, they've got 1984, they've got the Chronicles of Mother Loving Narnia. Ooh, they've also got all the completed books and A Song of Ice and Fire. If you're tired of waiting for me to finish reviewing that series so you can find out what the difference is to the show, but found the sheer size of the novels a bit off-putting, this is an excellent way into that series. Audible has one of the largest selections of audiobooks on the planet now, which means there are so many books you can download that aren't this one. <sighs> Books that aren't this one. And best of all, you can start listening right now for free by following the link in my video description and going to audible.com forward slash the dom or texting the dom to 500 500. You will get a completely free audiobook of your choice and two Audible originals from a curated list and a 100% commitment free 30 day trial. Seriously, so many books that are not this one. This one that I guess I have to get back to. Anna and Grey's conversation shifts to his birth mother, or the crack whore, as he never stops referring to her as. Anna is determined to get him to admit that he loved her and her death upset him, but he's like, no, my past is completely behind me. My mummy means nothing to me. Now have sex with me, person who looks just like her. Okay, I know this is more review than synopsis, but you're gonna have to forgive me for this one. He's been in therapy for decades and Dr. Flynn has never tried to make him face or acknowledge his feelings towards his mother. Isn't that like Psychology 101, so much so that it's the joke people make about psychiatrists. Hmm, yes, well, your high-stress job might be contributing to your high-stress, but uh, tell me about your mother. Good lord, no wonder Dr. Flynn said Anna has made more progress with Grey than he ever has. He's the worst therapist ever! Grey takes Anna to his second house in Aspen and invites along his siblings and her friend Kate, who is still dating his younger and much more pleasant brother Elliot. It's currently a moot point because it's not winter, but Grey makes it clear that he he never intends to let Anna go skiing because skiing is dangerous and therefore only to be attempted by grown-ups. Elliot proposes to Kate and they go out clubbing. A guy touches Anna's bum on the dance floor and she slaps him in the hopes that that will stop Grey from going apeshit, but of course he does anyway and decks the guy. The management of the club would of course not dare to throw out or call the cops on a millionaire, so there are zero consequences for Grey for this assault. There is in fact no effect on the story whatsoever, it's just one of many things that happen. On the plane ride home, Anna asks Grey if he misses punishing her, in blatant disregard to the fact that he never stopped, he just started doing it psychologically and sneakily instead of officially. The next day at work, Crazy Pants McFormer Subby Sub turns up at Anna's office with another former sub of Grey's asking for an audience with her. Anna has her bodyguard search them for weapons, then agrees to talk to them. Grey calls to forbid it, but she hangs up on him. In any other circumstance, I might have considered that progress, but I'm just a little surprised that don't meet with the woman who tried to kill you a few months ago was the hill that she was prepared to die on after all the mind-bogglingly unreasonable things he's demanded of her in the past that she has successfully managed to reason away because, you know, he had a hard childhood. X sub number two is mostly there for emotional support for X sub number one, who we're already familiar with, but she also apparently wants a look at Anna because she's the person who tamed Grey with her powerful feminism. 
Egg sub number one says she's here to apologise to Anna, but even Anna, the slowest woman on the planet when it comes to keeping up with reality, realises that this was an obvious ploy to get Grey to come running over and scare her away, so she could see him one last time. Grey dances like a little puppet on her strings and storms into the building, firing Anna's bodyguard and threatening to cut off all his financial support for XS1 if she ever comes back. Anna and Grey argue about how fair this was for a few minutes, and then of fucking course he gets turned on and wants to sex her up, telling her to skip the rest of the workday and come home with him. Which of course she does! I swear to all the gods, teenagers have more control over their hormones than these two idiots. After a clumsy as fuck time jump to a few days later, Anna is told that her ex-stepdad Ray and Jose's dad, Jose Senior, were in a car accident. Jose Senior is okay, but Ray is all messed up. She goes to visit him at the hospital, there's a lot of hand wringing, and Gray is made out to be the most caring, thoughtful person in the universe because he put his own baggage aside for five frickin' minutes and tries to be accommodating for her while she potentially watches her father die. He doesn't, by the way. He gets better, and none of the several chapters this takes up have any effect on the plot whatsoever. Jose Senior thinks this is the perfect time to slip in a little passive-aggressive guilt trip comment to Anna about not dating his son. So apparently not only are all of these characters scum, all their relatives are scum too! While at the hospital, Anna happens to run into the doctor that Grey hired to give her birth control shots, and she's informed she missed her last four. Apparently, her helpful secretary rescheduled her appointments whenever there was something else for her to do, and Anna never checked her calendar for herself. She is absolutely terrified of how Grey's going to react to this, and it turns out with good reason. He freaks the fuck out, screams at her and blames her for forgetting the contraception, and yells about how she's going to love the baby more than him. Him. He eventually storms out of the apartment, leaving Anna to cry and mope and feel like she's betrayed him and let him down. You know, like any true soulmate would. When he eventually returns home, he's shit-faced and somewhat more friendly. Anna helps him into bed and notices his phone and just cannot resist the urge to look through his messages to find out where the fuck he's been all night. To her chagrin, she discovers that he went to see the proverbial Mrs. Robinson, the older woman who made him her sub when he was 15. This enrages her to a never-before-seen level. Leaving Grey to sleep it off, she locks herself in the secret sex room to spend the night. The next day, Grey is freaking out because he can't find her, but for once in her life she does something that's almost akin to standing up to him and leaves her work. She gets a phone call from Grey's little sister Mia, but plot twist, it's Jack Hyde. He's out of jail and has kidnapped Mia and wants five million dollars or he'll kill her. Anna takes the gun from Grey's drawer, gets the money from the bank by telling Grey that she's leaving him, and is taken to meet Hyde by a work friend of hers who turns out to have been in cahoots with him. I have no memory of who this woman is, I mean no doubt it will come back to me later after research, but honestly, at the time of reading, I was like, okay, this person's evil, I guess. How could you, this person? Anna trusted you, maybe. Hyde starts to beat the crap out of Anna, but she shoots him in the leg, the police turn up, and suddenly that's the end of the climax. Yes, it really was that short and fizzled out that suddenly. A large chunk of the rest of the book is Anna recovering, while Grey tells her off for taking such risks while trying to save his sister's life, and gets in the way of the hospital staff trying to treat her by insisting on doing everything for her himself and refusing to leave for even a moment. However, he eventually promises to not see Mrs. Robinson anymore and give parenthood a try. Oh, by the way, it turns out that Grey and Hyde were very briefly in the same foster home when they were kids, and Hyde was mad at Grey for getting adopted by rich parents when he didn't. As I said earlier, this has absolutely nothing to do with Hyde's actions in this book or the last. No, really, zero impact on anything. The fact that he tried to rape Grey's girlfriend, got fired for it, and sought revenge was completely coincidental to their shared childhood. It serves no purpose in the book. The epilogue jumps forward a few years to when Anna is now pregnant with their second child, apparently a daughter this time. They appear to be partaking in just the parts of BDSM they both enjoy, and Grey gets on well with their kid. Their living the idyllic happy life available to the insanely rich. Or at least that's the ending that E.L. James would want you to read into it. Anna and Grey have had the occasional happy moments before, they're just inevitably followed by him doing something reprehensible. The fact that the epilogue took place in the quiet between their incessant bickering proves nothing! NOTHING I SAY! And that is probably more of the plot of Fifty Shades Freed than you strictly needed to know, but 
Remember what they say about what misery likes. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Please remember that the only thing more horrific than the fact that these books were bestsellers is the unpredictable nature of the YouTube algorithm. But liking, sharing, commenting, subscribing, and talking about how much you love this show with your friends is more helpful in combating it than you could ever know. Please do join me next time to hear my more detailed thoughts on what I just described. She wrote another book?! Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do, since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically, they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons, including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the dom, I can't do that, according According to the rather unusual laws of my country, I must defeat several alligators in Mortal Kombat before I'm legally allowed to support online content, and I'm afraid my reptilian martial arts are just not what they used to be. Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickeroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day, and I will see you in the next episode.